Yes, Presley. let's start. Mm -hmm. I I prepared a whole bunch of questions, but then this morning I read this conversation, this phone call between Biden and Xi Jinping. Oh, and, <laughs> they've they've met, have they? They've spoken, have they? Okay, right. Carry they, on. Okay, let's let, let's go forward. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They they spoke over the phone, and it just happened. And so part of the reason I totally forgot the time is I was working on it until the last minute. Imagine, yeah. So my yeah. brain is still a little bit. I'm still digesting. There's tons of the information there. I bet there is, yeah. Yeah. Um, the let me start. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what they are saying here is now both sides use the word candid and constructive. Okay, sounds mm -hmm. to me like a more or less friendly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one thing Biden talked about is uh, Yellen and Blinken will soon come to visit China. I I never quite understand they keep on coming to China. What do they really want to do? And mm -hmm. this time Biden even kind of like give a heads up. Okay, they're coming. Mm -hmm. So, but I still don't know what they're doing. And then mm. uh, from the Chinese readout is, you know, about Taiwan, um, U.S. government uh, suppressed the Chinese, China's trade and technology development. Mm. Uh, and then they mentioned, you know, the same old, same old stuff like a human rights, Hong Kong, South China Sea, et cetera. Doesn't seem there's anything new. You know, China has its mm. position, U.S. has its position, et cetera. Mm. That's the readout from the China side. Now, there is one uh, sentence. Um, now, in terms of the trade, dispute what is the readout from the White House. So this is what this says. The president emphasized, which is the President Biden, emphasized the United States will continue to take necessary actions to prevent advanced US technologies from being used to undermine our national security without unduly limiting trade and investment. Sounds to me they don't get lots of in, you know agreement on this one. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that in the Chinese readout, it says the two presidents also exchanged views on Ukraine crisis, the situation on Korea Peninsula, and other issues. So regarding Ukraine and uh, Gaza, I guess they talked all about that, which sounds to me like probably is the main reason Biden called, because according to the Chinese readout, it is by Biden's request. So mm. is that how I should read it? Well, that's a very good question, because, of course, it looks as if both readouts, as so often happens, are not telling us the whole story. And the American readout certainly is not telling us uh, anything like the whole story. I'm going to make a, a I'm going to make a, a, a quick guess. President Biden has a very difficult election coming in the United States in November. His overriding priority clearly is to get elected. So there's a number of things he wants at this particular time. He wants a, a peaceful situation in uh, the Pacific. Now, I say that, of course, he and his administration have been going out of their way to provoke China in every possible way that they can over the last uh, four years. And, you know, quite plausibly, they will continue to do that. But he doesn't want a crisis at this moment in time in the Pacific. So he's going to, he's trying to persuade, it seems to me, the Chinese to hold off. He also probably senses that there are problems coming up in the US economy as well. There's been a lot of discussion recently that the financial system is getting overstressed. The uh, trade and budget deficits are soaring. Debt is rising. I suspect that's partly the reason why Yellen is going to China. She wants to try to, they want to try to keep the Chinese trade at least going um, on you know, in a stable way. And lastly, he's got to be very worried about the overall situation geopolitically in the world. And there's been a very interesting article today in Politico. A whole lot of Ukrainian military officers have now been talking to Politico. Um, they were connected, apparently, with the former commander, General Zeluzhny, the general that Zelensky just sacked and who's now ambassador in Washington. And they are quite straightforwardly saying Ukraine is losing the war. If there is a Russian offensive and they think that will happen in August, Ukraine will collapse. I mean, if you read the article in Politico, it is it is pretty much... As I've described it, I mean, they don't use the word collapse, but it amounts to that. They say the F-16s aren't going to make any difference. They come too late. They say that Ukraine is running out of men. It's running out of weapons. 
they concede for the first time that you, the United States doesn't have the weapons or the technology to turn things around. And the key thing is, these are Ukrainian officers who are saying this for the first time. So Biden does not want a military collapse in Ukraine before the election. I mean, what happens after the election maybe is less of a concern, but he certainly doesn't want that before the election. So we have a critical situation developing in Ukraine. Um, the appropriation package is still stuck in Congress. The article in Politico admits that even if this um, package is passed through Congress, it won't be enough to change the situation on the ground. So what does Biden do? He can't talk to Putin. He's prevented himself from doing that. He doesn't want to collapse in Ukraine in August or September. So he calls Xi Jinping. Now, uh, also, uh, before we move back, I, I, I just want to ask you, uh, Vlad, uh, Zelensky recently had an interview with the CBS, right? In that conversation, he actually talked about, I mean, he got a very confused way to talk about things, but mm. I got it that he is willing he's to negotiate um, talking about the borders for 2022. So far, he has been talking about borders from 1991, mm. and now it seems like he's open to 2022, which means forget about Crimea. So that's mm. the message I got. Is that how you interpret that? Even though I don't see that would even be possible to go back to 2022 border, no. but at least uh, he seems dropped the Crimea. <laughs> Is that a sign he's getting at least towards more realistic approach now? Is that is that what it is? Is that what you take on that? Yes, he's under enormous American pressure. This is, I think, something that's coming across. He would also did an interview just before with David Ignatius of The Washington Post, in which he said that the Americans are telling him not to attack Russian oil refineries. Um, and he clearly is now getting pressure from the Americans to agree to some kind of a freeze of the conflict in Ukraine. So this is what the Americans are trying to get him to do. But if you go to what he actually says in CBS, to CBS News, what he's basically saying is, yes, you know, we, 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 you, we might accept just possibly doesn't seem at all enthusiastic about the mm -hmm. idea, but he does seem to accept possibly we might have to stop for a while and accept that the Russians go back to their 2022 <laughs> positions, which they're not going to do. I mean, there's no conceivable way the Russians will agree to that. But he's still talking about eventually getting back all of, you know, pre-2014 Ukraine uh, uh, through negotiations in some form. There's no way the Russians are going to agree to that either. So, you know, Zelensky is still saying, he's still setting conditions which uh, make absolutely no sense. Now, you know, if you are um, old enough, remember things as you know, historically minded as I tend to be, you will remember President Tu negotiating or setting up South Vietnam's positions before <laughs> the at the time of the Paris negotiations between the Americans and the North Vietnamese. And he was making similar demands. He was basically insisting on maximalist positions and, uh, you know, very grudgingly admitting that, you know, maybe, you know, we might accept that the North Vietnamese have a right to occupy a you know, millimetre of our territory here <laughs> or a centimetre there or whatever it was. But, you know, it was completely unrealistic and really bore no relation to reality. And um, Zelensky seems to be doing the same. And this is, I think, the result of the kind of people that the United States tends to pick as its proxies. They are very inadequate people in themselves, and they take very extreme positions because they think that will win them support in the United States. And then when American policy shifts, they find it impossible to change from that. President Ghani in Afghanistan was the same. Mm -hmm. And going back to this conversation now, um, the mm -hmm. Chinese media, which is very interesting, they're very quick, okay, started mm -hmm. to talking about this conversation. So some people pointed out uh, that 
almost right after this phone call between Xi Jinping and Biden, there's an interview Blinken did with the French media. Uh, the reporter's name is Darius Rich, Richabin, Rachabin. I'm sure I got mm. his name wrong, but he seems like a very influential French media person. Okay, so Blinken had an interview with him, apparently in French, but the uh, English transcript, is, you can find it in the State Department. Mm. So the Chinese media is saying, they paid attention to this interview, and what they're saying is that from reading their conversation, one can probably see what Xi Jinping and Biden talked about in terms of Ukraine. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> for example, um, here it says, regarding uh, whether Putin will take uh, Kiev. So this is what the what he asked, the report that the French guy asked. He said, is the United States in a position to promise that Ukraine state the, that Kiev will never fall into Russian's hands? And Blinken's answer is, I'm convinced we already have. In other words, it's not happening. It's never going to happen. Now, what makes me so strongly saying that, right? That's a pretty strong commitment. So the Chinese media was like, is this probably what Xi Jinping pass along to Biden that this is the promise from Putin? What do you well, think? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I would be surprised if um, Xi Jinping would pass along a promise like that from Putin himself. I mean, I, okay. I think this is a difficult thing to to to, to work out. To, to, okay. I, I, I doubt that Xi Jinping would do that. I mean, bear in mind this is a conversation that the Americans sought. And I think a very, very careful uh, man like Xi Jinping is, is going to be very, very careful about what he says. He'll probably ask the Americans to express their opinions and the Americans will set them out and um, he will listen. Now, I think it's highly likely that topics like that were discussed between Biden and Xi Jinping. And I would not be at all surprised if Biden did say to Xi Jinping, you know, we, we don't want we don't want the Russians moving further west <laughs> and things of that kind. Um, but as I said, I, I doubt very much that Xi Jinping would have made any kind of commitments of yeah. any kind, either on his own behalf or on behalf of the Russians. Yeah, that's what I think, too. I think actually uh, Putin will probably make that will not make that promise, right? Mm. It's good for him to have all the options open and it's mm. good to keep Kiev guessing, right? Mm. Just from pure strategic uh, position. But this is one thing that the uh, Chinese media was speculating, okay? This is just mm. speculating. Now, the other thing is I, I wonder, um, even though it's actually possible, Russia doesn't even need a weapon because I was reading that they are using some very powerful bombs. Now I don't know what mm. they are, but like the old D A B fifteen hundred, F A B three thousand. What are these things? I just got the feeling they are extremely powerful bombs. Can be. They very are extremely. They are extremely powerful bombs. That is exactly. I mean, they're not directed uh, part particle beam weapons or anything of that kind. They are straightforward bombs. Now, what has happened is that the Russians have enormous stockpile of bombs left over from the Cold War, and of course they make bombs themselves. They're very, 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 very big builders of bombs. Um, and um, what they have done, and this is again very like the way the Russians do things, um, they said, you know, they've got all these bombs there. Uh, they are, you know, ordinary simple gravity bombs that planes flew and they dropped. What they've done is they've managed to create a kind of package that they can attach to these bombs, which then gives them wings and guidance systems so that at a very, very cheap price, they become guided bombs and they become very, very effective, powerful, precision guided um, smart bombs. And it, it's exactly the, the Russians are very good at that. They're very good at improvising, using what they have, coming up with simple solutions, technological solutions. What the Americans would, would take them years to do at enormous cost, the Russians are able to do it very quickly, very cheaply, using limited weapons. Now, the result is that the Russian Air Force is now very active on the battlefronts. They're dropping these bombs, some of which are very powerful. I mean, one type of bomb that's been wheeled out carries around one and a half thousand ton, uh, a kilos of explosive, one and a half tons of explosive. So that gives you a sense of the enormous power that these bombs have. And um, 
A bomb carries far more explosive than a shell. A shell carries around seven kilos of explosive. We're talking about a bomb which can carry up to one and a half thousand kilos of explosive. The bombs are now raining down on the Ukrainians at a level of intensity that would make even the Americans, uh, you know, it, it puts even they would, you know, struggle to maintain this kind of tempo of aerial operations. And it is having a devastating effect across Ukraine. So these are actually not really even new things. I mean, they're old bombs, mostly left over from the Cold War. But the Russians have updated and improved them. And they're proving absolutely devastating. Now, is that part of the reason that um, even Zelensky kind of become a more, more, he has to be more realistic? It, it just, mm. on the, you know, in the battlefield, it's extremely devastating now. Now, mm. I guess that's part of the reason the response from this, what they did in the Moscow attack, is that part of the Russians' response? What the the bombing the bombing yeah. began before the bombing okay. began uh, okay. the the bombing has started since about December, um, okay. but it is having a cumulative effect all the time. But yes, it is it is it is uh, uh, what is causing the Ukrainians to fall back in many places. It is causing the many serious losses. But of course, Ukraine was already in a weakening position even before this Russian bombing campaign began in um, in earnest. In December, they'd already been defeated in the summer um, offensive that they launched, and of course, in February, they lost the city of Avdeevka. So, you know, it, it it what we're looking at is an accelerating collapse, mm -hmm. and they're short of pretty much everything. They're short of shells. Their air force doesn't work. The uh, m Ukrainian military officers who spoke to Politico said that the F-16 wouldn't work either, that the Russians are already ready for it. They've run out of air defense missiles. One of their cities, Kharkov, their second biggest city, is without electric power and has been for about a week. Uh, their army is short of men. I mean, it is turning into a, a very critical situation indeed. And there is no obvious way to turn the situation around. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we talk about this, that every day passes, right, that Ukraine, the, the deal it can get from Russia will not be as good as they get now, right, today. No. But they still keep on going. OK. They <laughs> the still other, keep on going. The, the other thing is um, the, the Chinese media also take from their conversation. Somebody is guessing, OK, because from this interview with the um, Blinken, with the, with the French guy, he's he was asked, the question is, okay, in Brazil, President Macron raised the possibility of Vladimir Putin taking part in the next G20 meeting. Now, the G20 meeting will be in November, okay? It's actually mm -hmm. after the U.S. election even. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure the coastal uh, country, Brazil, is thinking about this. And provided, he said, that it would be useful and, and there is a consensus among all G20 members, do you see as a possibility under these conditions? And Blinken's answer is, is there, if there is a consensus among all the members and if it is useful, yes. So the interpretation from the Chinese media is that because the last time in uh, South Africa, South Africa invited uh, Putin and Brazil has no problem to invite. The reason they're talking about is they want to see Putin come. I guess that's mm. what it is. And mm. South Africa and Brazil both are, I believe, ICC members. Now, even though nobody believes South Africa would ever arrest Putin, but still Putin decided not to go, mm. not to put South Africa into mm. an awkward situation. So mm. that that's the one thing that Macron is talking to Lula. Clearly, Lula, Lula talked to him about wanting mm. him to come in person. And it's possible that also uh, Xi Jinping is talking to Biden about uh, Putin come in person. That's another yes. that's another thing that they might talk about. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. That that is that is that is fully plausible. Of course, Lula is also a member of a BRICS country. You know, uh -huh. he, he which is also so he's got he's got that connection with uh, uh, both China and Russia as well. So they they might all be trying to arrange some kind of meeting, conceivably between Biden and Putin. I mean, which would be the first time. Um, bear in mind that whoever wins the election 
um, in November, Biden will still be president. Trump, Trump doesn't become president until January next year. So, you know, they might want to do that to try to see about getting some kind of talks going. But, you know, we're still a long way from that, that position yet. And of course, Putin himself will want many, many guarantees before he goes to Brazil. Now, it's not just that he would want guarantees from Brazil. The Brazilians are never going to arrest him, as you absolutely rightly say. That is inconceivable. But, you know, he has to fly to Brazil. He has to cross over many countries. Probably American bases will be nearby. He will want assurances that his aircraft won't be interfered with on the way. When he flew to Saudi Arabia and the UAE um, back um, in the autumn, he made sure that his aircraft was escorted by Russian fighter jets. Now, the reason he did that, again, was because he was wet, he was nervous. The Russians were nervous that so the Americans might try to force his plane down. So um, he will want absolute categorical cast iron assurances that something like this isn't going to happen. So it's a complicated negotiation that's going to be taking place. And... Um, the very fact that they're going to have to negotiate about these kind of things at all, of course, moves the envelope. Because if you're talking about means to get Putin to Brazil and, in effect, agreements by Western countries not to implement the ICC warrant, then already, in effect, the West is in retreat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how they make it work, right? That is, if ICC is going to drop the charges against him or find some kind of legal explanations that Brazil doesn't need to take any actions, you know, et cetera. I think that would be interesting to watch. It would be very <laughs> interesting to watch. Dropping the charges, by the way, would not be particularly difficult. Yeah. <laughs> they don't make okay. any kind of legal sense. So it would not be. I mean, you know, you can always get a judge to review the decision, come to the view that the case really hasn't been made out and drop it. It can okay. be done. Uh-huh. Yeah. And if it happens, then, you know, probably the, then we're correct to say, well, that's probably one thing that Xi Jinping and Biden talked about. Possibly. Mm, it, it might very well be. I mean, it's <laughs> I, I think if I can come back to the Chinese, mm -hmm. what they have been trying to do and working very hard to try to do is to get everybody talking to everybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I have to say this, I think this is much more likely than Xi Jinping giving um, you know, yeah. uh, Biden assurances that the Russians aren't going to attack Kiev. He's going to say, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, but I would guess that what Xi Jinping would say to Biden is, well, why are you asking me? Why don't you ask Putin himself? Surely it's Putin you should be talking to for assurances of that kind. And um, I, I think that if... Biden brought that sort of topic up, Xi Jinping would tell Biden, well, the very fact that you're asking me these questions merely underlines how correct I have consistently been in telling you to sit down and talk to Putin. I also wonder why uh, Zelensky doesn't want to hold the election. I mean, does he mm. afraid that he's not going to win the election? I mean, if he, I, I don't see any... Uh, opponent that he even has right why doesn't he just make himself a very legitimate president uh, why is that well i think what he is very afraid of is that the situation in ukraine is now very much um is barely under control if there is an election process then that might open up public debate and people might uh -huh. start uh, bringing up issues that you know, like mobilization, the state of the war, his own leadership, which he doesn't want them to do. So I, I think that it's a sign of the underlying insecurity, not just in Zelensky's own position, but in that of the political leadership in general in Ukraine, okay. that as the war is being lost, they're becoming increasingly nervous about the direction events are taking. Okay, that's the reason. Because it, I think Lavrov and probably even mentioned this, like uh, after mm -hmm. May 20th, you know, whether, I, I forgot exactly what he said. It sounds to me like, a, can we even take Zelensky as a legitimate president? You know, something like that, which makes yes. me wonder why. Did he say that? Uh, something? He did. He did say that's exactly what he said. I mean, he, he made the point that Zelensky's term expires in May. 
So you know, he's not constitutionally speaking the legitimate president of Ukraine beyond May. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I wondered why he just doesn't. Mm. Why didn't he just go go with it? You know, go go mm. through this and get it. Mm. But now you, yeah, the 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 bigger, the larger picture is that they're afraid. They're too much talking about this so that the Ukrainian people will know the truth, right? What's going yeah. on and yeah. think a lot about this. The more they think about it, the more they think this is a bad idea, right? Because if he's open to negotiation, the borders of 2022, to me, that is the mission of mistake. Because you could have that in 2022. You could have saved the whole thing. So many people died. These uh, agony they got two years, the, the, the past two years, pretty much is wasted. If you the end result is you go back to 2022 border, isn't it? Isn't that you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that's what they had before 2022. Yeah, but it's also <laughs> what they could have had in Istanbul, <laughs> but they didn't do it. They didn't take it. Um, they 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 had it there in their hands and they walked away from it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how how sad is it, right, for the Ukrainians, for you know to. To realize that that's probably part of the reason he doesn't want the election because like i said the, the, mm. more, the more people think about it right okay the best you can get is get 2022 then what are we doing for the past two years right correct so correct. that would be too much for the people to think through this thing yeah exactly. that, that makes sense okay going back to china now recently uh um xi jinping met a big uh, business delegation from the mm. us okay uh i i find First of all, what, what do you take on that? I mean, Xi Jinping um, seems really spending time on these kind of things. Even when he was visiting the United States, he was spending time with a business leader. Now, the mm. thinking is, uh, as long as both sides is still doing a lot of businesses, then mm. it make like an all-out war less likely. Is that how you mm. see it? I think this is completely right, but I think there's something further to this, which is that Xi Jinping has come to realize how incredibly difficult it is to work with the political class in Washington. Uh, that, you know, Biden, Trump, whoever it is, there's, there seems to be a kind of structural antagonism towards China. So he doesn't want to give up on the US relationship completely because that would be very dangerous. It would also be economically damaging to China. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to reach over the heads of the administration and is trying to talk to the leaders of the um, business community, the people who are in charge of the economic life of the United States. And what he said to them is this, look, the business relationship, the trade relationship between us and you works really well. You are the people who are in overall charge of the economy, much more than you know the president is. <laughs> We all know how the political system in America works. Don't let the politicians spoil it. Don't let all these crazy people who want to sacrifice everything to keep Taiwan free, as they like to call it, uh, and to keep America, you know, number one. Let not, don't let them run away and take control of the process and lead us into a disaster, which, of course, would be bad for us, but which would be catastrophic for you. And, I, you know, it's something which I think makes a great deal of sense. The Russians were never able to do that because they never established good business ties with the United States. Trade between Russia and the United States and the Soviet Union and the United States is very limited. But China has a huge trade with the United States. And that does create a very, very large and important section of the American elite, the business elite, who have an interest in safeguarding the relationship and not getting, let it get out of control. Well, then I have a question. Is that, um, is there a divide in the business community in the US? You see like Starbucks, FedEx and Disney, these are <clears throat> very much consumer driven companies. And for them, having a good re relationship between US and China serves them, right? It serves them well. Um, but the military industry complex like to have tensions between US and China. Is there a divide between the business communities in the US? 
Oh, yes, there is. It's, it's the short answer, and you're absolutely right, and you're completely right to point to the military-industrial complex. Um, you could argue the oil industry as well, to, to the extent that it retains any influence. There are, other, there are other lobbies as well, you could imagine. I can imagine some parts of the social media companies also probably not averse to conflict with China. So it's not everyone, but consumer goods, services, finance make up by far the bigger part of the American economy. Ultimately, the military industrial complex is important, but it's not dominant if you look at the overall economic picture. So, you know, you are talking to the people who logically matter most. I mean, it's 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 a difficult battle, but I think the attitude the Chinese take is that if you don't fight it, if you just concede the battle, well, then you lose. So you might as well fight it. You might as well go and find the people who are open to uh, what you say. And, well, perhaps you will win. Well, but I find that, that these people, including the consumer-driven uh, companies, they're not very vocal, uh, including, I find also in the United Kingdom, for example, like uh, um, insurance. Insurance is a big thing in, in China. And I would think a, a country like Britain has a very well-established insurance industry, could be you know, doing some business there in China, et cetera. I would think they would be interested in having a good relationship with China. Uh, in particular, insurances belong to financial services, which is kind of a sensitive area. So having a good relationship really helps. But I don't find it very vocal to stop all this nonsense, you know, all this rhetoric and, the, you know, the soundbite, all that kind of thing. They they just working behind the scene or they just quiet about it. What, how do you how do you explain that? No, I think they're I think they're very intimidated and very frightened to enter the political uh, uh, arena and to argue these things openly and publicly in the way that you say. I mean, for me, the greatest example of a business community that has destroyed its future by remaining silent is that of Germany. I mean, Germany's economic situation is now very bad, and the German business community sat back and allowed a whole series of catastrophic decisions to be taken. Uh, um, severing uh, Germany's economic ties with Russia uh, without protesting, uh, you know, despite the fact that that made the situation so much worse. And I think that there is a structural problem in the West that business people are very, very nervous of challenging political power. They, they don't want to be seen, you know, being written about in newspapers as agents of China or agents of Russia or any of that kind of thing. And I'm afraid this has worked very, very badly um, in the end. I mean, it shows that, you know, the old Marxist thing that, you know, the plutocrats, the businesses, the capitalists run everything is only partly true. It, it, it's, it's, it doesn't work quite in the way that, you know, that rather simplistic image of things might have suggested because... Um, you're absolutely right about insurance and finance in Britain. Um, I can tell you for an absolute fact, a lot of British business was absolutely overjoyed when David Cameron, who was then prime minister, spoke about a golden age in our relations with China. But again, they've sat, sat back and allowed it all to go wrong. And they've been very, very nervous of pushing back against it. Yeah, because this is, a, uh, actually quite a few of my, my viewers even ask that, right? That on the one hand, everybody's saying, okay, it is the money who talks. And so that's why mm -hmm. the Western government is beholden by the businesses. On the other hand, when they are clearly, the government is doing something hurting their businesses, mm -hmm. they seem pretty quiet, you know? So I guess there's also that uh, divide that the military industry complex, that's also business. And they are very powerful. They are politically more powerful than the consumer yeah. businesses, don't you think? Well, politically they are because they lobby. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they they have they they have uh, because their business is ultimately so intimately bound with government. I mean, they have to get the contracts from the Defense mm -hmm. Department, 
So that means they are very accustomed to, to lobbying in Congress to get, you know, appropriations for um, arms um, expenditure. So they are, they are very well organized in Congress. They are very well organized in the think tanks and think tank community um, to a degree that other businesses have not, are not because they haven't had the need until yeah. recently to do that sort of thing. So that, that does play a big role, I'm afraid. Yeah. And talking about the think tanks, so, so recently, um, I sent you the link, right? The Asian Society hosted this event between mm. Orwell uh, Scout and the Kishore Mahubani. And yeah, yeah so I for, for one thing, Orwell is very typical. It, this conversation got lots of attention in this Chinese media. Mm. Okay, I think the reason is, it's actually pretty clearly illustrated the problems that between China and the US, how, mm. how the US feel about China. Mm. Orville is very representative. Mm. To me, the stunning thing is Orville is a person who's supposed to be the China expert, right? And <laughs> Kishore even said that. He said that he's the expert, I'm the observer, China observer. And yet mm. Orville doesn't seem to know China that. I mean, no. I thought he has been spending decades working with China, visiting China, you know, communicating. And mm. yet he still have this view that it seems like the, the consensus of the uh, American elite's view on China. Why mm. is there so few really good scholars in the West. I can almost count them in one hand. I think Jeffrey Sachs is one. I think you are one. And maybe a few others. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a scholar or expert on China. I visited the country <laughs> once and I don't speak the language. But I speak to Chinese people. I read the Chinese media. I take an interest in China and I have no fear of it. I mean, that's a fundamental point to understand. Jeffrey Sachs, of course, has been there many times and he knows Chinese people very well. But you're absolutely correct. Um, um, you know, these people, the so called expert community, aren't experts at all um, they don't not only not only do they not know much about china they don't want to know very much about china because of course they think already that they know all about it because you know they have their particular very strong prejudices and ideological positions and that's enough and of course it's worked very well for them up to now because they can say all kinds of things about China every day, horrible things, untrue things, <laughs> mistake things, things that get proved wrong time and time again. I mean, last time we spoke, I told you about the last article in the Financial Times talking about crisis in the Chinese economy. Which, what crisis? But you could go on like that. You know, Gordon Chang has been doing it since, what, 1979 or wherever it was. I mean, article after article, churning them out. And, you know, you can be wrong an infinite number of times and provided you're saying the right thing, you're still an expert. So that is that is a fundamental problem. And of course, what that interview showed is that these people do not like to be challenged. Mm -hmm. They don't like to be faced with somebody who tells them things as they really are. And that, I mean, they get very angry when that happens and very frustrated and all kinds of other things um, of that kind. There, there's been another classic example. There's a man called David da David Goldman who writes for Asia Times. Now, I, would, I don't think he claims to be an expert on China, but he clearly knows a, a certain amount about the country. And he was attending a meeting of so-called experts. He's written about this in Asia Times. And he said, you know, you're, you're talking about a country, China, that doesn't exist. You have no idea. You don't understand anything about it. You don't understand anything about Russia. You don't understand anything about Ukraine either. And he said, you know, you've got, you, you think that you're so powerful um, and you have a stockpile of 4,000 cruise missiles, which makes you think you're strong. And you make your cruise missiles by hand. China makes them in automated factories. They're capable of making 4,000 cruise missiles in a week. And I know that is true, by the way. I happen to, I actually happen to know that is true. And what do they do? They all close their ears. <laughs> it is remarkable because it's all about China, right? And everybody sees China as the enemy. Well, isn't there is a thing, you know, according to Sun Tzu, 
you know, the Chinese um, yeah. war philosopher, know your enemy, right? And know yourself mm -hmm. and know your enemy. But they don't, it's remarkable. What I find is that, that they know so little about China. They are so not curious about China. Mm -hmm. They make assumptions and they go with assumptions, yes. right? Yes. That's, that's very remarkable to me. Whereas in China, people are studying U.S., they do. I mean, the tiny scholars are watching everything happening and do analysis and etc. It it seems seems a very different attitude towards how to deal with the other side. However, you, you uh, characterize them. You know, it is a profoundly different attitude about how uh, you know we deal with the other side. Now, I'm going to push back on one thing. I mean, there are a lot of good Chinese scholars in okay. Britain. I, I I know them, and they are deeply frustrated about the fact that they're not consulted or spoken to. There are a lot of people in uh, Britain who I know um, are experts on Russia, people who've been to Russian factories, who know all about the way the country works. I've been actually canvassing recently, trying to you know, ask them, you know, throughout this confrontation we've had with Russia, has anybody contacted you from Whitehall, from government? They will tell me, no, no one has. Not one person has spoken to me about this. But, you know, with China, one, some of them are my friends. I know, you know, in the academic world, um, Catherine uh, has friends who are China scholars. Now, I will say, preponderantly, um, academic studies about China in Britain are all, you know, looking at the China of the past, you know, what the first emperor did and, uh, you know, the Ming dynasty and all of that. But nonetheless, they do have a feel for the country and a certain understanding of the country that comes from all of that. And they do travel to China quite a lot and, have, and that gives them an understanding. But the point is they are not listened to. Yeah. And the problem also is that the, the political class at the moment, is closing in on itself. It probably senses at some level that things are not going to plan, that it's no longer in control. And it doesn't want to hear that. It doesn't want to hear that the world around it is changing. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure they're also very good scholars within the United States. They just yeah. We just don't hear about them, right? I guess that's... that's... That's the problem. That... I mean, if I am going to say something, actually, I think that there is, at least in Britain, and I suspect in the United States too, an mm -hmm. imbalance, especially about China, in that there is much more scholarship I know of, of in Britain, which looks at pre-1911 China which is all wonderful. I mean, it's ma magnificent. I mean, there's the tremendous literature, tremendous art, tremendous history. But there is, um, I think, an, un uh, an unwillingness to deal with the China there is now. Now, I, I, my fascination with China always was about the China of the past. But it's important to remember that there is a living, you know, um, actual vibrant country it's not you know uh, it's it's not like ancient egypt it's a place that exists today and mm -hmm. you have to think about that too obviously it's good to know about the past but you've also got to address the present so you you'll find lots of people who write about chinese calligraphy books about it for example all very interesting or very wonderful um, um art that needs to be appreciated more in the west but you also need to understand how Chinese factories work, how the economy works, what uh, uh, systems of organization are, the political structures, how they interconnect with each other, what people think in various towns and cities and, and provinces, which are all different from each other. There isn't enough of this, nowhere near. And to the extent that it happens, it's all boring and uninteresting things, you know, that um, this person and, you know, joining the Politburo and that person is leaving the Politburo, you know, as if that really matters. Um, very much, you know, like it used to be with the Soviet Union. You're always looking at, you know, who's up and down, and you know, which order they sat on and stood on in Lenin's tomb. And, you know, maybe that made some sense with the Soviet Union, but China is not the Soviet Union. And it doesn't, with China, it doesn't make any sense at all. 
And as I said, I, I, I've, I've come across this myself, dealing with so-called China experts. And I mean, there are few who study modern China, and those that do tend to look at the wrong things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very interesting uh, because I remember Jeffrey Sachs actually talked about this uh, in one mm. of the, those uh, forums. I think he was actually in Greece. I think um, they, mm. there is some democracy discussion, something maybe a mm. year or two ago. And he actually bring this up. He he said that uh, if you look at today's China, there is still a lot of a trace of what happened like a thousand years ago, uh, 2000 mm. years ago. And if you look at today's Russia, it's very similar to the SARS Russia, meaning mm. history has a lot of impact for these countries, you mm. know, how they work, how they function, and including mm. their leadership style, you know, the mm. the, mm. the whole relationship between mm. the government and the, the people, right? Yes. China is still a very centralized, I mean, they try to at least centralize the which has been the case for a long mm. time, a thousand years, ever since the mm. Qin Dynasty, right? Mm. And then Russia, you know, this uh, uh, national, you know, the, the the Russia center, it's it's a federation, but Russia mm. also have that character as well, which it seems like for the Russian expert, the China expert, they don't seem to make that connection. They don't seem mm. to put them together to mm. have a full understanding of those two cultures. Right. No, not not at all. No, absolutely not. I mean, in in any event, I have to say that Westerners, as a general principle, find it very difficult to relate well to non-Western cultures. Uh, it, it's they find it they find it especially difficult to take them seriously and to give them to give them equal weight to their own. And unfortunately, that does distort understanding very very badly. Um, I mean, what I like to say to people is, you know, if you look at the whole history, human history, you know, uh, uh, for most of that time, China has been the biggest and wealthiest part of it. I mean, it's not always been the case because every country has its up and down. Mm -hmm. But the the assumption that many Westerners have, you know, that, you know, this period between uh, 1800 and 1950 was a sort of typical period in China. It's not. It's the anomaly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the anomaly for the West to be as dominant as it has been. <laughs> you know, Westerners, as they find this very difficult to accept. Yeah, I, I think in particular the U.S. because U.S. has a short, <laughs> short, very short history itself, right? The the modern day his, uh, U.S. And so, and for that period of time, people right now who are in charge is grown up or oh. used to the idea that the U.S. is the dominant power. I, oh, I this is absolutely true. You're, yeah. you're completely correct. I mean, the United States has never e existed at any point in time without being richer and mm -hmm. more powerful than the countries around it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no experience at all of treating other countries as equals. Uh, no conception of it. I mean, it has never had to um, work or trade or establish relations with other countries on an equal basis. And the Americans have no imagination or conception of that. And and that's possibly also explains that, that they don't feel the need to study others, right? They don't. Absolutely. <laughs> they don't feel. Well, indeed, absolutely. I mean, and you know, bear in mind, it's a young country. It's mm -hmm. to some extent a artificially created country. It was the product of a, you know, a, a break away from Britain and of a constitutional system that was created then. So, in in a kind of a sense, I mean, you know, they they uh, still want to believe that you know they're not just the present but the future as well, because <laughs> that's what they've always been. And if they're not then what are they exactly? So that makes them particularly difficult to de to to deal yeah. with. Yeah. Okay, the Middle East, right? It's mm. <laughs> there's so much to talk about. Um, I just like yesterday or the day before, the World Central Kitchen got hit by this uh, Hellfire mm. missile. Mm. Now they're saying, "Oopsie, sorry, we didn't mean it." They use this uh, Hellfire, which is a isn't that precision guided missile? Mm. Mm. Seems to me they very much know what they were doing, right? And why, why is this the way um, 
Netanyahu is giving a middle finger to Biden for his abstain vote in the UN ceasefire resolution. Is that what he's doing? I think it's exactly what he's doing. I also think the other the attack on the Iranian consulate uh-huh. in Damascus is exactly the same thing. I think he's basically pushing back very hard now on the Americans. He says, you know, you can talk to me however you wish. I will just go on doing whatever I want, even if it includes attacking um, the Iranian consulate in Damascus, threatening to create a wildfire across the Middle East, or killing your own people in Gaza. Mm -hmm. I think that's basically what it's about. Now, Netanyahu truly want to bring the US in to this whole conflict, right? And he's under a lot of pressure, isn't he? He, he, Domestically, there were people Mm. protesting uh, now, the protest is not just limited to those uh, hostage, their families mm. and the sympathizer supporters, but mm. also some other Orthodox uh, Jewish people who do, mm. do not want to do the military services, etc. Mm. right? So domestically, he's under pressure, of course, the, the mm. Israeli economy is collapsed, right? And then all the, mm. the, the battleground, I guess, is not doing nearly as good as they anticipated, right? Mm. With the fight with the Hamas, it didn't go very smoothly at all. Is that also true? That they were totally underestimated the situation? Is that? I think you're. I think you summed it up perfectly. I mean, I don't know what exactly the advice was that Netanyahu was given back in October, but um, every military person I spoke, including American ones, said that you know going to Gaza would have been a terrible mistake. That it would that, that you know, destroying Hamas was going to be an incredibly difficult thing to do if it was achievable at all, and that the Israelis would get bogged down in an in, un, you know unending war there, and there would be thousands and thousands of civilian casualties, and it would play very badly in the world. And exa- that's exactly how it's turned out. He he led Israel into a trap in Gaza. The war there is far from concluded. In fact. I understand that Hamas has been barely affected by all the things that he's been doing. He's been uh, um, threatening to enlarge the war by attacking Hezbollah. He hasn't yet done that. Um, and as you correctly said, the economy in Israel is contracting and severely contracting. Mm. So he's under intense pressure. The Americans are tired of him. There's people in Israel who don't like him, but he keeps the war going because, of course, it while the war is still going, he thinks he can still control the situation, at least in Israel itself. And he has good reason to think that in America, which he knows very well, by the way, he will my, he will his friends will eventually come to his rescue in some form. So this is what he's doing. And of course, he doesn't want a peaceful outcome or a restrained outcome, because he knows that if that happens, He's not only going to lose power, but he's going to be discredited. And and the Biden administration is always I, I I always find it very strange to understand it. Okay, on the one hand, they did abstain, so we got a ceasefire resolution, which is mm. good. Uh, but then again, uh, on the on the other hand, he is just green light the eighteen billion sales of five five mm. F fifteen fighter jets. Mm. Mm. So he continues to unconditionally supply. I mean, this missile probably is the U.S. missile that hit this world uh, uh, central kitchen, possibly. So I don't see there, what is the, the Biden administration's thinking and policy exactly to to have a some kind of a risk, some kind of a way to solve this problem in Gaza? What is their, their way out? I don't think there is a single American Biden administration policy. I think pr- there's people like uh, Secretary of State Blinken, who I think probably would want to cease fire and some move towards um, a negotiated outcome ending in a two-state solution. I think that's probably what he would want. Um, I think the president himself, his instincts are to give Israel everything it wants and to support them all the way. I don't think he's particularly interested in negotiated solutions. And I think there's all sorts of other people in different parts of the government who have different views and different policies, some of whom are not very interested in the Middle East, but are worried about the way this is all playing out in advance of the election. So the result is you get different people pulling in different directions. So one day, America abstains on a ceasefire resolution of the Security Council. Then the next day, it comes back 
and says, well, the ceasefire resolution really doesn't change anything, which, which by the way, is untrue, that it's not binding. That also is untrue. Um, then uh, you have the president saying that, you know, he's telling um, um, Netanyahu to moderate his stance and he's going to have a come Jesus moment with him. And the next day, as you say, he authorizes $80 billion of arms sales. Um, th there is no single policy. And I, I think that it would, it, in truth, it would need a much stronger president than this one, mm -hmm. given how fragmented the political class in Washington is, especially over the Middle East. It would be a much stronger president than this one to chart a strong line over the conflict in the Middle East, either to fully back Israel or to do what Eisenhower once did and to tell them to stop. And in line with that, also, I was thinking this uh, Operation Prosperity Guardian in the Red Sea, right? Isn't this right now, U.S. is in a pretty peculiar situation, right? They, they can't just leave. Clearly, they can't. At the same time, I don't think they're really serving any purpose there because isn't there is a, a British cargo ship sink recently? Mm -hmm. And by the calculation of the Chinese media, there has been, and, and that's what the Houthi also claimed, that they hit like a total of 87 different <laughs> ships from mm -hmm. the West. Now, not everyone sink, of course. In most of the cases, they just pull off the, the fire, etc. cetera. Um, but still, they got hit. So this yeah. whole idea, this prosperity guardian ship, is not really protecting anybody, but at the same time, they can't just leave because that would be too embarrassing. So what should they do? Well, uh, the, the, you're absolutely correct. They've walked themselves into another trap, just as Netanyahu led Israel into a trap in Gaza. The administration has walked into a trap in the Red Sea. <laughs> they they have committed themselves to safeguarding shipping that passes through the Red Sea, but in fact, they've been exposed as completely ineffectual, and of course. It is costing a huge amount of money to keep up this operation. And I know that there are complaints in the Pentagon. People are saying, you know, we've got all these valuable ships um, in the Red Sea doing nothing useful when we need them in other places. So it, 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 it's a failed, a failed policy, one that the administration themselves have no answer to. And you're perfectly correct to say that this administration can't pull those ships out. Another administration might be able to, because the only thing that you could seriously, logically do, if you're, you know, got your ships tied down and they're doing nothing, is take them away. But uh, um, you know, this administration can't do that, because that would be a total humiliation for them. The obvious, the correct thing to do, the 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 right thing to do, for the U.S. government would be to work towards achieving some kind of general peace in the Middle East and seek a ceasefire in Gaza right away. But doing that would require a united, joined up government led by a determined president. In the 1950s, Eisenhower could do it. Today, I don't think any American government can. And, and it's interesting, that's what you're saying, right, that they do need to have a, a resolution and have some kind of solution about the Gaza mm. situation, because that's how it started, right? The Houthis mm. made it very clear that if mm. you stop the um, all the fighting there, we will mm. stop, right? And it's interesting, just recently about this uh, ship, um, mm. they, they call it a Chinese ship named Huangpu. And the I think both the Pentagon and the, the, the US uh, media has made it that, okay, the Houthis actually hit a Chinese ship uh, called the Huangpu. But the Chinese media actually reported that that's not entirely true. Apparently this boat, even though it's called the Huangpu, it was a British uh, boat. It's called uh, Anavatos 2 or something like that. And it was registered a month ago, a registered company in Hong Kong. And that ship was kind of like sold it to this registered company, which has just one ship, What the, this one. And in the meantime, as they transferred the ownership from the British to this Hong Kong registered company, and they changed the name to a Chinese name. But when it was hit, it was carrying a Panama flag. All right, so if you listen to the Chinese foreign ministry, when they were asked the reaction, 
they were not condemn the Houthis or anything. They just no. said, say, we condemn, you know, any uh, destruction of any civilian, no. you know, sh cargo ships. Oh. But they did say, uh, we strongly emphasize the need to solve the Gaza situation. See, that's what the Chinese are saying. So well, they're absolutely right. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're talking complete sense. Uh, uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're talking logically, but, you know, people in Washington and London are not listening. That's the trouble. And, I mean, this Huang Pu, it, okay. it sounds to me as if somebody, some ship owner somewhere said, well, Chinese ships are passing through the Red Sea. So what I've got to do is give my ship a Chinese name and re-register it in <laughs> Hong Kong. And the Houthis went, realize that it's me and my ship and we'll leave it alone and of course the houthis aren't that stupid <laughs> that yeah. was really what happened <laughs> yeah and i think the houthis have a it's no secret that the russians are and then and the iranians are helping the houthis right mm. and from the russians perspective it, it makes perfect sense because you guys mm. have been non-stop helping ukraine right and so mm. i'm it's mm. only natural i help the houthis mm. so that's another mistake that i think uh, mm. this whole operation was mm. ill-conceived from beginning i think yeah. and you're you're absolutely right again. I mean, you know, why why shouldn't the Russians cause trouble for the Americans in the Red Sea? Yes. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, if the Americans are going to do what they, or cause trouble for the Russians in Ukraine, on a much bigger scale, by the way, why wouldn't the Russians, yeah. you know, pay the Americans back in their own coin? Yeah. Which is what they're doing. But it's interesting the way they reported this, right? That the media emphasized, oh, this is a mm. Chinese ship got hit. I mm. guess the, the Pentagon was talking about this. I guess the reason is they want to, they, they, they certainly know that China knows this is not really a Chinese ship. Mm -hmm. But they reporting on this, is that what they're trying to say? China, you need to get involved here. Is that, that mm. their way want to get China to come into this situation in the Red Sea or something? It's exactly the same as what we were talking about earlier with Ukraine. They want the China, China to come along and pick the coals for America out of the fire. <laughs> so they want the Chinese. We've got all this mess. We've got a mess in Ukraine, we've got a mess in the Red Sea. Um, <laughs> but we want you, China, to come in and sort it all out for us so that, you know, we don't have to make any difficult decisions. <laughs> we can just have the Chinese do it. So, you know, if we get outcomes that we don't like. Well, you know, it's not us, it's the Chinese. They came in and they did all this. They gave Eastern Ukraine to the Russians and they capitulated to the Houthis in the Red Sea. And he so said that, that ultimately what this is all about. And of course the Chinese are very practical people. They want trade to continue properly through the Red Sea. They want peace in Europe. They will do what they can, but they won't simply do that in order to help pick the coals for the Americans out of the fire. Why would China do that? Uh, but still, the Gaza situation is still getting more and more serious, right? The Chinese mm. media is estimating in 10 to 14 days, Gaza could run out of food. And they're mm. even saying that that means it might be a possible scenario could be humans start eating humans. Now, mm. I really hope we don't go there. But mm. there is a real possibility. It seems to me like a, um, Israel, that's their their plan to starve people in Gaza. Yes. And the, the, re the rest of the world, we, we call ourselves the civilized people, right? Mm. And we just watch. We just sit here and watch. It's unfolding. Yes. How, 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 can we, how can we do that? It is, it is, you're completely correct, by the way, in all that you just said. And how can we do that? Well, we do that because our political leaders in the West, in the United States, in Europe, um, are still committed to a policy of global Western supremacy, and they see support for Israel as facilitating that, and they still see uh, Europe as part, as well, Israel as part of that world, as part of that Western world. Um, and I'm afraid you're absolutely correct. We are going to see terrible things happen in Gaza. We're going to see uh, an appalling humanitarian catastrophe there. I, famine and other terrible things that happen come with famine, very, very likely. Um, but, and that is, as you correctly say, it's the Israeli policy. I mean, why did they attack that kitchen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, 
that's their policy. They want to create famine conditions in Gaza. Um, but, you know, we are accomplices to this. I mean, yeah. you know, I, 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 if I start trying to explain it, what the Western governments are doing, the risk is that I sound like I'm justifying it, which I don't want to do. But, I mean, you know, for, for Western governments, again, ultimately what they want is for Israel to win in Gaza and the problem to go away. About the Palestinian people, they care nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and then one of the uh, congress congressmen in the U.S., uh, he even said something. Now, somebody recorded it. Um, he, he wasn't uh, talking to the public. He didn't know he was recorded. Mm. He was talking about, um, like, a, the Japanese solution, you know, the nuclear kind of thing, and get it over with. He said something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly what I said that about Ukraine as well, by the way, that he wanted yeah. nuclear weapons to be used against the Russians too. But, I mean, it was about Gaza that he was mainly speaking. And it, uh -huh. it gives you, again, a, a sense of the psychopathic nature of some of these people. Yeah, I I know. I mean, there will be one day our, you know, next the next generation they will look at back in this whole thing and they will be stunned by this. They would say, "How can you let this happen?" They would. They would ask us that questions. I think they will. Yeah, I mean, bear, bear in mind if you look at the long history of Western involvement with the world, it has been marked by extreme violence. So, in some respects, this is not that much of a break from it. Um, well, if these people, I'm sorry to say this so simply, if these people in Gaza were white with blue eyes and blonde hair, people wouldn't be talking about them in that kind of a way. Um, um, you see how much attention there's been to the fact that six aid workers, Western aid workers, were killed um, at, this kit at this kitchen. You know, 30, 40,000 other people have died. Yeah. But... Western governments are more worried about the aid workers. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is your take on Turkey's uh, local election? This is a local election, right? Erdogan mm. still uh, will be the president. Uh, I think his term is uh, 2028 20, or something. So, yeah. So, but does this uh, election uh, affect his policy, his relationship with Russia, with the US? What do you take? <laughs> I don't think it affects his overall position or Turkish foreign policies at all. And by the way, um, people I know in Turkey tell me that there isn't actually much opposition to Erdogan in terms of those things. Um, it does mark increasing exasperation amongst Turkish people with Erdogan's economic policies, which um, are eccentric. And he's allowed inflation to get completely out of control um, over many years. He's pursued policies of not support, you know, not raising interest rates and doing all sorts of things. I mean, economically irrational decisions. So what he's been doing recently is he has finally accepted that interest rates have to rise. He's accepted finally that there has to be a monetary tightening. That has, of course, led to a recession. And as is always the case, there's a lag before the prices start to fall. So this election has fallen at a precise point where people are seeing the price that Erdogan is paying on behalf of Turkey to correct his previous mistakes, but they're not seeing the benefits. So the result is they're voting against him in local elections, but it doesn't affect his overall position. Okay, so it's domestic problem. The economy. It's a domestic. It's a purely domestic problem. Um, Erdogan himself, by the way, in my opinion, I mean, he, he doesn't look especially well. Um, I think he's probably uh, we're probably coming to the end of the Erdogan era, but I, I don't expect Turkey once he goes to simply revert to what it was like before he came. I think he's um, achieved a massive change in outlook in Turkey and in the way the Turkish people see the world, including their uh, political class and their middle class um, altogether. So, I mean, he, he's left a powerful legacy behind him, which I don't think this election changes. And, you know, there's plenty of time for him to turn things around electorally 
I think what he needs to do is to stick with his current economic policies. They will, I'm confident, eventually um, bear fruit. Mm -hmm. The inflation will come down finally. Mm -hmm. The economy will rebound. It's a very dynamic economy in Turkey. And I think that at the end of that point, um, some of his popularity, probably not all of it, but some of it will come back. The economy is a hard thing to to do, isn't it? It's a it's a lot easier to be very aggressive towards another country, you know, turn the attention to another country, versus really doing the hard work to improve people's living standard. Isn't that a pretty hard thing to do? Seems like you you are absolutely correct about this. I mean, <laughs> running an economy, uh, um, you know, it's a fifteen hour job every day, and weekends too. It means you know it it means spending a huge amount of attention, thinking all the time, talking to experts, having meetings, picking the right people, and uh, uh, working with people so you know who the right people to pick are. Um, of course, people who do it well actually end up enjoying, enjoying enjoy doing it. But it, it's very, very hard work. Um, Putin, by the way, gave uh, an interview a couple of about a week ago, in which he actually slipped out what it was like. He said, it's like standing under a waterfall. You, the, the water never stops falling on you. There's always something you have to do. He says, you know, I, I, I may be meeting people, but I know that as soon as the meeting is finished, the telephones will be ringing, people want to speak to me, and then I have to prepare for the next meeting, and I have to do all of those things. But he also said that, when you get into the pattern of making decisions, eventually it becomes easier. You know what kind of decisions to make. You know how to make decisions. Um, what at one point looked impossible becomes routine. And um, Putin can do that. I think there's other people in the Russian government can do that. I don't know the Chinese government so well, but it's absolutely obvious to me that Xi Jinping does it too. Well, about the economy, I think at one point you, uh, you and uh, Alex uh, Christopher, you were talking about this that economy has its cycles, but seems like in the West now doesn't accept that the economy is slowing no. down, right? Now, and, and which is also explains that whenever there is a little slowdown in China, everybody's oh it's collapsing, you know whatever. Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty natural if let's say China's economy slows down. I actually think it's a pretty normal thing, right? The economy has mm -hmm. its cycles, but somehow including in the West that in, in the United States in particular, okay, economy cannot slow down. And mm. whenever there is a slowdown, they just print money. They have to mm. beef it up and somehow. But in the long run, it hurts the economy, isn't it? Because when the economy slowed down, my understanding, uh, not being an economist, but that's the time when you get the, the, the bad companies who cannot survive long-term to get them out, you know, clean up the system. And then you go to the next wave and stuff like that. There, there, it should be a healthy kind of like a clean itself, you know, correct itself kind of a process. But it doesn't doing that. Every time when there's a problem, the U.S. government will jump in to save those banks mm. and save this company and that company and print a whole bunch of money, which mm. create problems down the road, isn't it? You are absolutely correct. You're completely right. I mean, it's a point I made many times that um, what Western governments have been trying to do since the 1990s basically 1980s late 1980s is abolish the business cycle <laughs> they 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 think that um i mean first of all they made a, a fetish out of gdp and gdp must always rise and the result is you get goosing goosing up gdp figures and um that takes you away your attention from your real economy which is the economy in which people live and work and make businesses and produce goods and engage in tr trade and business with each other. You're not looking at that. You're looking all the time at a particular set of statistics that you want to keep uh, pointing always in a big direction. And you're quite right. I mean, you know, it doesn't, it means that the economy doesn't have moments of pause when it just reorganizes, and recalibrates. Um, you don't you you try to avoid recessions. I mean, recessions 
classical economists always understood recessions as a necessary part of an economy because exactly for the reasons you said it clears out uh, whatever is bad um, allows whatever is good to survive and there's expansion there's recovery all kinds of things like that happen but no we can't have that anymore nothing must fail everything must continue and um, the result is that the the economy goes slowly it gets it get it goes more and more bad now uh, what people have been talking about in china they're talking endlessly about a chinese economic crisis what it is is that there was a bubble in the housing markets and in the in, with the land markets the chinese government isn't bailing it out it's not doing what westerners do it yeah. is allowing this thing to play it to play out but if you look at the rest of the economy it's it's expanding yeah. manufacturing which is the core of the chinese economy is expanding and um, people are actually getting richer so this isn't this isn't it's not about gdp statistics it's actually about real growth in the economy and improving improving standards now as china understands that the chinese leadership understands this we you know we talk about xi jinping but i don't get the sense that there's anybody else in the top leadership in china who says you know this is all a mistake we should go in a different way we should do what the americans uh, uh, want us to do um i i've never got that sense the chinese understand that in in the west people don't if there's a recession it's a terrible thing it's seen as a failure to have a recession um, um, and you've got to keep your ex economy expanding and avoid recessions at all times. Well, we see the result. Yeah. Yeah, and the inflation now that we got is part yeah. of this uh, printing money, right, during the pandemic, yeah. and yeah, and yeah, so got it lost. And by Absolutely. the way, the, the inflation seems really high in Canada now. I have read multiple, and including people living in uh, Canada, are complaining how unattainable the whole situation is. Is that Absolutely. also the case in, in Britain as well? They Absolutely so. I mean, you know, if you're talking about the things that people have to spend money on, <laughs> then, I mean, it, it is becoming it is becoming unbearably hard. Um, the British living... I mean, first of all, the British economy, to all intents and purposes, has never recovered from the 2008 crisis. Um, we are still a smaller economy than we were then. Living standards are significantly lower. Debt levels are rising. Uh, tax levels are now higher than they've been at any point since the 1940s when Britain was paying off its Second World War debts. So that gives you a sense of how bad the situation here is. And inflation is very, very high. But of course, we don't call it inflation. We call it a cost of living crisis because we don't want to talk about inflation because that's you know, a, a word that we prefer to avoid using nowadays. I, I think they manipulate the number uh, oh. also Be mm -hmm. because there is the inflation number is, is uh, combined with food and, and uh, drink, you know, all those necessity together with uh, like uh, appliances and uh, appliances, their inflation is not as mm -hmm. bad as the food, but food affecting people's daily life, right? Yes. And so they, they, they make it sounds not too bad, but actually, if you look at just the food, I also noticed, and the shrinkflation. The other day, I was mm -hmm. buying a, a mango drink. I don't taste the same mango drink. They just mm -hmm. <laughs> put in so much water in there, you know, that it, it doesn't taste much of a mango at all. <laughs> but well, it's the, the, the same price, is... maybe even higher, you know, so... This is absolutely correct, by the way, and it's a, a feature of high inflation economies that the quality of goods falls yeah. because you are uh, uh, you're using f you're putting fewer components into it. I mean, shirts, for example. I mean, you know, you you, you produce shirts which have less and less cotton and more <laughs> and more cheap, cheaper synthetics. I mean, um, if you go to Argentina, that's a where they have perennially high inflation. This is a well-known phenomenon there, but it's starting to affect people in the West too. So you're completely right. You also see this in Britain, by the way, which is that with food inflation, um, uh, and, I've, I, and Catherine and I, my wife, we've noticed this for a long time. If you go to the shops, 
you notice that all the jars have got smaller. <laughs> the prices may be the same, but you know, there's actually less food in them. The <laughs> jars have become so the bottles of milk have become smaller. Um, you know, so you get smaller, smaller tins, smaller jars, uh, things of this kind. It's messed up a lot of recipes, you know, because mm. when I'm baking, I'm using the recipes that telling me, you know, that one yeah. jar of this, one jar of that, you know, mm. it's yeah. it's no longer work. <laughs> Well, completely correct. That's yeah. entirely true. Yeah. All right. Um, before I let you go, a little bit of things, a little, something lighter. Okay. Um, <laughs> now there's a tradition uh, of a boat race between Oxford and uh, Cambridge, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. apparently, I, I just saw that in the the Guardian saying that they have this tradition to jump into the the, the winner would jump into the water, mm -hmm. but they are not allowed to do so this year because the water is so dirty. Mm. Is this some mm. kind of a joke? When I first saw it, I was like, "Is this April Fool's joke?" But it's not. It's it's not it's it's not a it's a it's a very sad and bitter truth. I mean it right. I mean I should say the, the boat race, which is the one that the two big universities, Oxford and Cambridge, fights uh, uh, have with each other on the River Thames, is one of the great um, public events in Britain. It's something difficult to convey to our to people outside how important it is to British people. But my wife, for example, follows it enthusiastically. And, you know, you have all of London comes out and watches these two boats going down the river. And it's been going on since 1829. So it's, you know, it's an old, established, very, very popular event. And as you correctly say, at the end of it, you, you, you know, they dunk the captain of the winning boat into the Thames. Of course, they don't dare do that now. And there's been reports that um, some of the crews, one of the crews of one of the boats, that they were having all kinds of viral infections and other infections, E. coli and all that kind of thing, because they'd been too close to the water and the water in the Thames has become incredibly dirty. And Thames Water, which is the uh, water company that is responsible for keeping the water in London clean, is about to become bankrupt. <laughs> and okay. There's talk. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it is, I'm afraid, another story about the state of Britain today. Now, what is very sad for people like me is that there was a huge effort um, 30, 40, 50 years ago to clean up the Thames because, again, at that time it was very dirty and it was very successful and you started to get fish started to appear on the Thames and people started to fish on the Thames. And now, of course, all that's gone into reverse. Um, it's a symptom of the overall decline in Britain, which is actually very sad. I mean, yeah, yeah but I was just surprised yeah. because Thames is so important for Britain. Yeah. It's almost like a symbol, right? The, the, yeah. the newspaper is the Thames, right? So, so, uh, so I thought, First, seriously, when I first read it, 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 the Chinese media pick it up, and I thought, "Oh, this is an April Fool's joke, you know, some kind." <laughs> but, but no, it's not. No, no, no yeah. it's not. I mean, it, you're absolutely correct. It is. It is very symbolic of Britain and of London. I mean, you know, the, the London, the whole area of London is built around the Thames. Um, people talk about the Thames Estuary as the core of England, and it's true. And people who speak, who live in London and live on the Thames, have a specific accent. Cockney, as it used to be called, estuary, as it's called today. I mean, the, 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 the very much part of the, the, very much part of the life of London and of Southern England is, is based around the Thames. And it, it, it has an enormous role in national culture. And, of course, the boat race was a part of it. And remember, Britain was a seafaring country. So, yeah. um, you know, London was its major port. Not anymore, but it used to be. And the ships used to go from London to the sea, and that was what made Britain <laughs> what it was. But now all of that is in the past. The city of London as a financial centre is in steep decline. I mean, where it had been, I think, something like the third most important after uh, the United States and um, Tokyo, you know, when I used to work there. Now it's, I think, something like the 20th. I mean, it's at a yeah. steep fall. And um, the Thames, 
which is you know place where you I mean I mean one of the things we used to do I remember was um, we used to after work we used to go to the Thames and sit on its banks and uh -huh. have our sandwiches and our coffee you know whatever it is and people used to chat. <laughs> One doesn't want to do that anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Yeah, again, you know, uh, economy to improve economy is not an easy job. You know, it's not like anybody can just do it, right? You you do no. require long term effort and a lot of work. Yeah, it's... lot of work, lot of work, lot of long term effort, imagination, and organizational skills. Now, one of the reasons I, I I'm told this by um, Westerners who've been there, one of the reasons that Xi Jinping attracted a lot of attention before he became Chinese president was because he had made a big issue about cleaning up pollution in China yeah, yeah. and was very successful. And, you know, that demonstrated to people, firstly, that he was concerned about the everyday lives of people in a very specific way, a very important way to them. And secondly, that he had the drive and the ability to do it. And, well, I'm afraid, let's say... Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, then no Xi Jinping. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing, Xi Jinping was very popular once he became the president is the, mm. his fight against the corruption, corruption, which the Western media interpreted that as he's trying to get his uh, political opponent out of the way. But that's mm. not how the Chinese people see it. Maybe there's yeah. some his political opponent, but he's pretty harsh against the people. Uh, like the former uh, foreign minister, uh, Qin Gang, my understanding is because, you know, he had this extramarital affair, but extramarital mm. affair itself is not illegal in China, but mm. the, the Communist Party take that very seriously because mm. it will lead to corruption. That's what they yeah. believe, that yeah. why would anybody want to, you know, young woman want to be with you if you have nothing, you know, financially to help them or something, right? So mm. it's related to corruption. That's why extramarital affair is being regarded as something really a big taboo within the Communist Party. And that's, I think, very popular with the, the general public in China. Well, making I, I completely, I can completely understand why. And we, we were talking about Thames Water. Fundamental problem with Thames Water is what, it used to be a nationally owned, publicly owned um, company. It was part of you know the, the whole British water industry, which was publicly owned. And then it became private, and then it was sold out to various companies, and it's now uh, owned, I believe, by an Australian business, and they've taken lots of money out of it, and all kinds of contractors and all kinds of people have basically, um, you know, drawn the life out of this. And by the way, you have this in Britain. I mean, if you go to Britain, and one of the things you will find, for example, is that in London, uh, the roads are always being repaired but they're never repaired. I mean, you know, there's always holes. It's always, yeah. often, often you don't see any workers, by the way. I mean, this, but um, you, you have this in the health system today, which is still supposedly publicly owned, but mm -hmm. it's privately run and you have all kinds of contractors. And those contractors often have connections with politicians. Money goes around the system. We don't call it corruption. <laughs> but in China, that's precisely what they would say it was. Yeah. Now, Xi Jinping, of course, learned because uh, what happened in 1989, big part of the people angry is the corruption, right? Yeah. Uh, that on the one hand, the, the reform uh, privatized some business, you know, public business yeah. that lead to mass layoff. Yeah. On the other hand, then you have government corruptions going on. You, you put the two together, of course, you get people angry. And I yes. think Xi Jinping learned from that. I think the, yeah. the, the party leaders, many of them, they learned from that, I yeah. think. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, corruption is a terrible thing anyway. I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about many of the problems in Britain. Uh, as I said, corruption is never something the British ever admit is a problem mm -hmm. in their country. I can tell you it is a huge problem in Britain. I mean, some years ago, we had a major crisis when it turned out that um, there was the phone hacking scandal, that one of the newspapers was systematically hacking the phones of various people it was interested in. And it turned out that it was also giving regular, they were, the, the, the people from that news company, Rupert Murdoch's, were regularly yeah. giving presents to police officers. <laughs> presents or bribes? 
<laughs> Nobody called them brides. Right. They were always called presents. But apparently, well, I can tell you for a fact, this is a systematic problem with the London police, for example. Um, and as I said, people don't call it corruption, but it is what it is. I remember what you talk about. I, I, it's the mm. sun, right? Isn't that the sun? Yeah, that sun, they, that's right, yeah. yeah. It, it was a huge yeah. scandal that affected many people and got the yeah. public angry. Yeah, it did. It got the public very angry, but nothing happened. You see, nobody uh -huh. who no, the, there was, I think, one conviction of one person who wasn't particularly important. All the executives who were involved uh, uh, were acquitted, and they're back in post. There was some rearrangement of the chairs in mm -hmm. the uh, um, police. And there was all sorts of claims that all kinds of things would be done to regulate newspapers more tightly. And in the end, all that was dropped. So everything went back to how it was. And corruption has simply got worse. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk something light at the end, but... <laughs> well, I mean, Thames... Yeah, well, I mean, it is, in some ways, I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is funny, but it is also a bit yeah. sad. To yeah. British people, it is sad. I mean, it, it's a, it's a sad it's a sad part of our lives, and it's again something that's among many other things that are going wrong around us. It's one just one more. The boat race actually got attention in China too. Every year, people pay attention yeah. to that too. Yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. why this year this thing become the thing. It's like mm. what they cannot jump into the water. The water is yeah. that bad, you know. It's the water, was, the water is the water is indeed that bad. <laughs> that that like a lot of people surprised, you know. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, I'll let you go. Yeah, go and ahead. It, and, no, I just wanted to say, I mean, the Thames in some parts of London has never looked particularly attractive, but oh. there are other places where, and in Oxford, for example, it is beautiful. Uh -huh. it's, you, okay. you, you see, and so, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a, it is a sad story altogether about this river. And it's, so the race is in London, not in Oxford or in... No, the race is in no. London, It's but, uh, which okay. makes it particularly spectacular because there's okay. all, all the people in London, young and old, and this goes back a long, long way, come out to uh -huh. the riverbanks and they watch it, even even though they can watch it on television. And it's very festive event, you know. Okay. Um, there's, there's a kind of carnival atmosphere. It's very attractive. And it, it, it shows the British at their most, uh, at their best, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll let you go. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you. Have a very Thank good you day. So much. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.